All right, so today I have good news for you. We are finishing our sermon on God's will. So by the end of the day, you will obviously be able to tell exactly what is God's will for the entire rest of your life. So you are all in really good shape, I think. <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, uh, as we gather, what we really need is prayer. So let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we thank you so much for your presence here today. We thank you for the way that you love us and the way that you hold us and the way that you surround us with your love. We pray, God, that this day as we reflect on your word, as we reflect on the way that you lead and guide us, we pray that you would continue to speak to us, continue to teach us, continue to help us hear from you. I pray for the words of my mouth and for the meditations of all our hearts, that they would be pleasing in your sight. For you, O oh Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, so when I was in my first year of seminary, I had a friend who introduced me to a song called Smell the Color Nine. And it's uh, written by an artist named Chris Rice. And the song talks about how hard it is to find and hear what God is saying. One of the verses says, I'm not looking for burning bushes or some divine graffiti to appear. I'm just begging for your wisdom. And he said, I believe you're putting some right here. Um, but in spite of the belief that he proclaims, and it's there throughout the song, he also says, sometimes trying to find you is like trying to smell the color nine. Uh, and then the very end says, because nine's not a color, and even if it were, you can't smell a color. And that's my point exactly. And you see, it was a really good song for me in seminary because I needed to know that sometimes God's will is hard to find. I knew and felt a calling, and I was pretty sure I was in the right place. But some days, uh, some weeks, when the professors would stand up and say, you know, ministry is challenging, and you'll have this problem or this problem, and I thought... I don't know how to handle that, or I'm not sure I want to handle that. And it got scary at moments, and um, it has continued to be scary at moments. <laughs> um, <laughs> we all go through hard stuff in life, right? And it's hard sometimes to figure out where is God in the midst of that. Um, so we've been on this series, this journey, talking about the will of God. And Pastor Don uh, did some good work laying out for us uh, the first two phases of this. We've been using a book by a pastor named Leslie Weatherhead. And so Weatherhead says there's the intentional will of God, what God deeply desires for all of us. And we sort of talked about Adam and Eve in the garden before they ate of the fruit. They were in perfect communion with God. But then circumstances happen. And sometimes, like Adam and Eve, it's our sin. And sometimes um, it's it's the fault of nature, a hurricane comes or a tornado uh, or cancer comes, and that, that all of these circumstances happen in our life. And then God's will begins to be seen in different ways. There's God's circumstantial will at work. And that doesn't mean that God is beaten by the circumstances, but that sometimes the way to God becomes a little more uh, convoluted uh, but not defeated because then there's God's ultimate will. And we believe that one day in heaven, God will be with us and we will be with God. And it'll be just like those first days in the garden when there was no shame and no guilt. And so as we discern all of that, that may or may not have been helpful to you to lay out those three types of God's will. Because what I think we really want to know is what exactly is God saying to us? How do we know what God's will is for us? And so Weatherhead, there he is, Leslie Weatherhead says this, you can not be certain until you get to the end that you won't make a mistake, for you must travel by faith more than by sight. Did you hear that? He said, you got to smell the color nine, um, <laughs> more or less. If he had been around today, that's probably how he would have said it. Uh, he said, you can't be certain until you get to the end that you haven't made a mistake. I remember um, praying so hard 
uh, before I went to college, God, please, please help me find the right college and the right school and the right place for me. And, and I was not sure uh, what that choice was. There were leanings and there was things that kind of felt right eventually, but I wasn't sure. And then much later, I heard a pastor say something I wish I'd heard in those years, which was that it's possible that all three of the schools you were looking at were in God's will, that there wasn't one right, perfect choice, that God could work out his will at any one of those schools. It's about that relationship and continuing to listen to God while you're in it. So we can't know for sure until we get to the end. However, um, there are... Uh, there are ways and resources that we have that can guide us in this process. And God does, in fact, we believe, lead and guide us. And while there may not be divine graffiti that appears, if you want to know the reference for that, there's a biblical reference in Daniel 5 about a hand that appears on the wall and writes out the, uh, some words. Uh, sometimes that happens, but very often uh, it doesn't. The reason it makes it in the Bible, right, is because it was unusual and, uh, and people needed to know that that happens. Um, but a lot of times that's not how we hear God. And so Weatherhead gives us then six su ways, six suggestions for how to discern what the will of God is in our life. And they're more or less in uh, order from like least important or least helpful to to the most uh, important for us. And so we're going to go through these. There's a lot to cover, and um, I'm going to try to move through it as quickly as we can. So uh, conscience, common sense, advice of a wise friend, the voice of a church, of the church, the Bible, and the Holy Spirit. Now, um, all of these, I think, are good and helpful, but before he gets to those, he says, the greatest help available in discerning the will of God is when we deepen our friendship with him. That's my favorite part, probably of the whole book, that if you want to know God's will, the very best thing that you can do is to deepen your friendship with him, to spend more and more time with God. That's how we begin to be a little more certain of where God is leading us. And he gives this story. He says, imagine that you're planning a retirement party for someone, and you're with a group of colleagues, and one a person in the group has known the retiree, the soon-to-be retiree, for a year, and one of them has known the retiree for 50 years. And you're all trying to decide what gift to give the retiree. Whose advice do you think is more helpful, the person who's known them for a year or the person who's known them for 50 years? Right? Obviously, it's the one who's known them for 50 years. So we, we want to deepen our friendship with God, deepen our relationship with God. And this, then, is the way that we become uh, able to discern God's will. But that doesn't mean, if you're brand new, 10 minutes into knowing God, that you are out of luck, right? That God still is there guiding and leading and helping us along that path. So... Um, the first thing he gives us is uh, conscience. Um, just like in the little cartoons, the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other, um, he says, this seems very lowly, conscience does, but it's possible that those voices, or the voice of good anyway, is, is actually the voice of God. Why wouldn't that be God speaking to you when you're exhausted and you're tired and you're coming home from work and the thought pops in your head, I need to run by and see my friend who's been sick. Do you think that that might just be the voice of God speaking to you or when you're deciding, should I... I, I don't know, pick a thing. Uh, should I go volunteer at the food pantry or not? And, and the one voice says, oh, but it's such a nice day. I really want to go play golf. And the other voice says, you should go help with Feed My Lambs. Like, which voice do you think might be the voice of God? Couldn't it be that your conscience is actually God speaking to you? Now, Weatherhead says we do need to be careful about that because there have been plenty of times throughout history when no one's conscience was moved about real evils. Uh, for instance, slavery. 
history remembers that as a terrible time. We all look back and say that was an awful thing that happened in, uh, in our, our history. And there were many faithful Christians during the time of slavery who were arguing wholeheartedly that that was God's will. And, and, we, and their conscience was not at all bothered by it. So conscience is not the only way that God speaks to us. It's not the perfect method for discerning God's will, but it is a way of hearing from God. Then the second one that he talks about is common sense. And again, this is a fairly simple tool, and we might be likely to dismiss it. Weatherhead says, uh, tells this story about a man who prayed for advice, and he said, nothing happened. I got no answer to my prayer, so I decided to use my common sense. And then Weatherhead says, well, who gave him his common sense anyway, right? That sometimes your common sense is actually a way to discern God's will. You can't pray, dear Lord, please let me not ever get sunburned, and then go lay out in the sun without any sunscreen for five hours and expect that God will simply protect you from that, right? Sometimes... God gave us a brain for a reason, and we use our common sense. Maybe when you pray for travel mercies, part of the way that God is giving you travel mercies is that he gave you a seatbelt, right? Those are common sense things, and it doesn't really, we hardly ever say, thank you, God, for my seatbelt. But maybe that is a part of the way that God answers our prayers, right? So, um, like with conscience, it's not always the case. Sometimes God calls us to do things that are contrary to common sense. Going to preach to the enemies in Nineveh, that is not common sense. Entering a lion's den and assuming that God will take care of you and close the mouths of the lions, not common sense. Building an ark when it's never rained, not common sense. Sometimes God calls us to do things that are contrary to common sense, and we have to listen to that and be aware of that, but sometimes just use your common sense, right? That might be God at work. Um, so then we get a little deeper, and uh, Weatherhead says, use advice from a wise friend. Now, this is not meant to be the person that you know with the highest IQ. Like, give all your friends an IQ test, and whoever's the smartest, that's the one you go and listen to. Sometimes that person might be your wise friend, and sometimes not. The wise friend that you trust is the one that you know is prayerful, the one that you know is filled with the Spirit, and the one that you know who will push you, right? God doesn't give us very many of these friends, I think probably because we wouldn't listen to them and we'd get annoyed with them. But every once in a while, God gives you friends, I hope you have one, that'll push you, that'll challenge you, that'll ask you those deep questions that you've been avoiding in your heart. And those are the friends that we need to go to when we're struggling with a problem because those are the friends that are going to speak God's wisdom to us in a way that we'll be able to hear. These friends are a gift from God, so we treat them with love and grace. The next one that, uh, that we are given is uh, the voice of the church. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in his letter from the Birmingham jail that the church is called to be the thermostat for society and not just a thermometer that reads it. He wanted the church to set the temperature for culture and not just record it. One time I had a congregation member, this is like two churches ago, um, who said to me, I think what's prob the problem with our world, everybody knows what the problem with the world is, right? Um, she said, it's that these teenagers today aren't in the church. She said, how do they know the difference between right and wrong if they're not in the church? She knew that she had in her life been guided to know the difference between right and wrong because she'd spent a lot of time in church. So the church has a voice and it's powerful. And in our church today, this has become a particularly poignant issue. I thought if I preached on this topic like, I don't know, two, three years ago, maybe this is the part you would have slept through. Yeah, yeah, the voice of the church is powerful. Today, maybe um, given the, the denominational upheaval that we've been going through, this particularly point becomes a little more powerful. 
And some of you, I know out there, think that the church should be on the forefront of culture and society, making these firm political declarations about God's justice and God's will for our country. And if I were to take all of you who think we should absolutely be a loud voice for society, and then I asked you what that voice should say, you would split into two different camps, or maybe eight different camps, right? That, that we all have an idea of what God's voice is, and we're all very clear that the church should be speaking it, but we're not quite able to agree on it. And so then there are some of you who say, well, because we can't agree, the church shouldn't say anything at all. The church should hide away and just talk about prayer and the Bible, and we should leave all that political stuff out of the church. The problem is that sometimes prayer leads us to care about the world around us, and sometimes the Bible calls us to care about the world around us, and so then we have to discern, and that, again, is where it gets tricky. And so I want to uh, suggest to you that perhaps what the church is at its best is a container, a place where we can go and ask the questions that we have, a place where we can go and wrestle with those worries on our hearts, a place where we can hear the voices on both sides of whatever issue it is, and a place where we can say, I'm really listening for the Holy Spirit, and we need to pray together. We all need to work together to where God is speaking to us. And it dawned on me as I was trying to write this section, what is the voice of the church? It's your voice. It's my voice, certainly, because I get paid to stand up here, but it's also your voice because you are the church. And so we together get to figure these things out and, and work at it. So the voice of the church is certainly important, um, and I hope that the church can be that container, um, that space where you can go and really ask those questions and spend that time in prayer. Um, the Next one, then, that we have is uh, the Bible. Uh, the Bible is, of course, uh, our best resource for hearing God's word and knowing God's will. We carefully read the Bible, and we recognize that it is God's word. It's a remarkable book and our best source for understanding God's intention for our lives. We look at it closely, and we learn what God is saying for us. Uh, the verse that I shared with the children, um, God's word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. One time I had a professor in seminary tell me a little more about that verse. He said, do you know what the lamp is that they were talking about in that verse? He said, it's uh, those tiny little oil lamps that you sometimes see uh, that have just a tiny little flickering flame. He said, the light that God gives us for our path is... <laughs> not a big, it's not a torchlight, all right? It's not um, a stadium light. It's a tiny little dim flickering light. And very often, God gives us the direction for the very next step we need, but not the whole path. And that gets frustrating sometimes. But honestly, think about your whole life so far. Would you have wanted to know every step of the way that you'd been on and know that those things were coming? Sometimes knowing just one step at a time, a couple steps at a time, is all we can handle. Um, so we look at the Bible, and we study it, and we read it, and we pray over it, and we know that God speaks through it. And God does, indeed. It is our light. Um, but sometimes it's only a light for one or two steps on the way. Um, and then last but not least, we have the power of the Holy Spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit. And we believe that not only do we have God's printed word to guide us, but that we have God's word inside of us. This amazing gift we call the Holy Spirit. And we use all of the other tools to help us understand those internal voices that are indeed God inside of us, within us, speaking to us. And so we take time every day to listen for God's voice speaking to us. Now, as we get to wrapping up, I don't want this to be a sermon about how to hear God's voice in six easy steps. 
right? These are not easy steps. Maybe common sense is easy, but, but the rest of them are pretty hard. Hearing and understanding, being certain of God's voice is not easy or simple. But again, I want to say that we are not without resources. We use the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the wisdom of the Bible. We rely on Christian friends. We understand the proper role of the common sense and conscience in our lives in understanding God's will. And then at the very end of the chapter, Weatherhead asks these two questions that I think are really key to the whole discussion. And this is where we'll, we'll stop. He says, one, we have to ask ourselves, do I really want to discern God's will or do I want to get God's sanction for my own ideas? That's a tricky one, right? And then the second one is equally tricky. Have I got the courage to do God's will once I discern it? So these are two questions that, that we need to hold in mind that sometimes we do indeed want to follow the Bible. Uh, we do want to follow God's will, but also sometimes we're afraid of it and we have to take that courage and so we pray. And so this then leads us back to Paul um, and our text for today. And I know I didn't get to spend a lot of time uh, unpacking the text for you this morning, but, but this is what Paul says, these two things that I want you to hear. One, he says uh, to the church in Philippi, this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless. So Paul says we can pray. We can pray for knowledge to know what is best. And the other thing he says, this is in verse 6 of chapter 1, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. So ultimately, we know that we can trust God to keep working in our lives, to keep refining our heart, to keep guiding and directing and leading us so that God can carry his work onto completion in our lives. Know that God does love you and longs his ultimate will is to bring you to redemption and his eternal kingdom. So let's put ourselves in God's path and continue on that way. Let's pray together now.